camp is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame.
Amen, amen. Come on, lift up a shout of praise.
their children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the online service for the Westside Church. We're really happy you're with us. My name is Danny, and this is my husband, and we've been a part of the Westside for, oh gosh, I think over six years now. And next week, we're going to be celebrating our fifth wedding anniversary. You are welcome. <laughs> we've officially made it into 2021. I know for many of us, 2020 it was a tough year, battling a pandemic, job insecurity, social unrest, mm -hmm. having to learn about Justin Jump's favorite toilet spray, which is cranberry. On a brighter note, many of us are looking forward to 2021, myself included, and have set goals, whether that be spiritual, uh, emotional, physical goals. And we here on the West Side want you to feel supported and loved through your journey through 2021 and while you go pursuing your dreams. I'd like to read a scripture now to focus our minds for the morning. It's in Revelation 21, 5. 
He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write these down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. We would like to connect with you. And you don't have to just do that today. You can do that any day throughout the week. We meet in small groups throughout the West Side, online, of course. So that gives you the opportunity to connect with us anytime, any place. And we would love to get to know you more and hear more about your personal story and where you come from. Really, our hope is that today will transform you to draw closer and inspire you in your relationship with God. So once again, welcome to the West Side Church. Let's pray for service. Dear God, Thank you so much for bringing us together. I know so many of us had a really rough 2020 and we're looking forward to a great 2021, but regardless of what comes, we're so grateful for the church community and the sanctuary that it really provides in the uncertain times. We do pray for the service and all the hands involved. We pray that it's just a great time of worship together in our homes. We love you and thank you and your son's name we pray, amen. Good morning, church, and a happy new year. My name is Serena Woon, and I'm a first year public relations major at Pepperdine and a part of the incredible Alpha Omega West Side Campus Ministry. It is truly an honor and a privilege to share communion with you all this morning as we start off the new year. Communion is the perfect time to reflect on what it means for Jesus to die and sacrifice himself on the cross for us, his beloved children. I do wanna start off with the scripture in Colossians 1 verses 21 to 22. It says, at one time you were separated from God. You were his enemies in his mind because the evil you did was against him. But now he has made you his friends again. He did this by the death Jesus Christ suffered while he was in his body. He did it so that he could present you to himself as people who are holy, 
blameless and without anything that would make you guilty before him. Personally, I grew up in the church with parents who led up here in the Bay Area. A large part of who I am is what I've battled almost every day for the last seven years. I've had pretty serious depression since the seventh grade where suicidal thoughts became almost like it was a part of my morning routine. Going into high school, I was a varsity rower, a martial arts instructor, attending a competitive high school, taking college courses, and studying the Bible. My first two years of high school were what we would call very rough. There were pressures from all sides of my life, whether that be my academic life, my sports life, or church life. On the outside, I was doing well in school, losing lots of weight due to sports, and studying the Bible like the good Christian teen. I was acing every aspect of my life. But what others didn't see were the many nights crying and pleading to God to spare me of the burdens of my thoughts or the times where my cuts and scars revealed the depth of my internal torment. On top of all that, I was doing all the things that parents in the church think their kids aren't doing, but actually are. I genuinely didn't think that I would make it through my junior year. I was being crushed by my own self-hateful thoughts because I didn't feel good enough, smart enough, spiritual enough, thin enough, just not enough. It wasn't until I actually journaled, read, and prayed specifically about God's love that I saw that love from a different perspective. A perspective not like the one I had grown up learning in Kids Kingdom or through the disciples I had constantly around me. It was an immense and overwhelming love he has for us and what it actually meant to have Jesus die on the cross for me and sacrifice his perfectly blameless. It was then that I truly understood the scope of what kind of being God is and what kind of relief I could have through him. Now, through my own relationship with God and the many struggles I've endured in the past few years, whether that be being a teen disciple with internal conflict in the church or losing a very close loved one, I've been able to cement my faith in why I need God, not to just solve my problems, but rather bring him along as a father who can guide me through them. In the campus ministry, I've been able to build incredibly deep and meaningful friendships without having to have grown up with them or know their parents somehow. I've learned how to lean on God and trust him during the days I can't even get out of bed to endure and persevere on. The biggest blessing though, is being able to connect and relate with so many people of diverse backgrounds, sharing how, although my depression is in no way eradicated, but instead slightly alleviated enough to share the good news with others, using my experiences to be relatable to so many others who are fighting the same internal and mental afflictions every single day. I really love the scripture in Colossians because it talks about how God uses the death Christ suffered so that we could be friends with him. I know no person, much less a friend of mine, who would willingly sacrifice themselves for their enemy's sake so their enemies could have better lives, ones with purpose. Yet God did so through Jesus so that he could make us, the people who can betray, ignore, and disobey him to become holy, blameless, and without any guilt. It is a new year where all of us hope that 2021 will be better than 2020. It can be a fresh start, and what better way to start the new year than to feel the weight of guilt, blame, or sin come off our shoulders. With Christ, we can go into the new year holy and blameless in God's sight. Let's pray. Dear God, I'm so grateful to be here today to share about communion and what you did for us through the sacrifice of your son. I pray that we as a church can remember why we continue to work hard for our relationship with you and the importance of taking the bread of your body and the juice of your blood. You love us so much and have done so, so much for us. Our admiration and appreciation of you simply do not measure even closely to how much you find us precious and valuable on this earth. Please bless the lesson today as we get to listen to you work through another amazing minister. I am so grateful every day to be a part of this church, of this body, but more importantly, a part of an incredible relationship that I get to have with you. I pray right now that everyone can connect to you and the meaning of the cross. I love you so much. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace that's right in every high in stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor Good morning, everyone. If you're visiting for the first time, you're tuning in, welcome to the Westside Church. We're so glad that you can join us. My name is Kenny Izuchuku, and I serve as a minister here. And I'm so glad it's 2021. Can we just give a shout of praise in your living rooms or if you're in your bedroom or wherever, just yell, let's say something, just shout. It's just so good that we're finally in 2021. Happy New Year, Westside brothers and sisters. I am looking forward to seeing you guys soon. Um, man, 2020 has been an insane year. And here's just a few significant events that really stuck out to me. In January of last year, we know Kobe Bryant, one of our beloved Los Angeles basketball players, and his daughter Gina, Gina along with seven other passengers, were killed during a helicopter crash. Remember that? That was a year ago, January 26th, I believe. And then just a few months later, in March, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which blew up. And oh gosh, it just led to in a state of emergency, a closure of schools and lockdowns in all states throughout the world. And then just a few months after that, we had the killing of George Floyd. 
and it sparked a heightened awareness and increased tension of racial and social injustices at the expense of particularly black Americans. And you fast forward just a few months ago, we had the presidential election. And there are 160 million Americans who voted. It's the highest voter turnout in over 100 years. 2020 was crazy. And I don't know about you, but this has been one of the most tumultuous years in my life. And I've been forced to go to God in ways I've never had to before, which has been really good, but also very uncomfortable. But luckily, it's 2021. It's 2021. Let's just shout again. Let's go. We are starting the new year and we know that God is a God of new beginnings. And each year, it just feels like we can press that reset button. And no, it doesn't erase our past. We're still in a pandemic. And no, it doesn't guarantee that things are going to go our way in the future. But it reminds us that we can just take a deep breath. A deep breath and know that we can start anew. Coming into this year, 2021, I want to share a few thoughts with you. A few thoughts that I've been able to glean from my times with God. And I've been reading in the book of 1 Samuel, which we're going to dive in today. And it's been such a great time to really connect to the Word of God through the Old Testament, um, through the Tanakh. And I think many times it's easy to kind of gloss over this stuff, but I want us to dive deep in here. And I won't have enough time to get through it all, but I'm going to do my best to give you a little snapshot of this incredible book. And the title of my lesson today is Moving Forward. Moving forward. And I love that concept because it's not static, it's dynamic. It's, we're in this present world, we're acknowledging stuff from the past, but we're also bringing it in a way that we can advance, we can move forward. And here's a picture of me staring over Florence, Italy, and I was trying to figure out at this time, what am I going to do with my life? And I was doing mission work in England, in Birmingham, England at the time. And things were rough there, and I won't get into all the details. If you want to know, just ask me, and I will tell you later. But it was a hard, hard time. Very difficult. And I was trying to figure out in life, like, what do I need to do? So I take this trip to Florence, and I'm there just staring and just trying to figure out, what am I doing? I was there for hours with my friend. And he took that picture of me. And I can tend to dwell on the past. That's my nature. I can replay things over and over again in my head. Things that will never change. But I remember sitting there and just praying to God. Asking Him, can you please show me? What do I need to do to move forward? And it made me think about our lives in America, in the U.S. And what we've gone through this past year. And I think for some of us. It's easy now that we're in 2021. Our bodies can be here. Our bodies can be in 2021, but our mentality is still stuck in 2020. And it's kind of like taking off in a plane. And you're going, and you're going, you're, and you're trying to get to a destination, but you hit some turbulence. So then you start to circle. And you just stay in this holding pattern. You go around and around with your thoughts. And maybe it's insecurities. Maybe it's frustration. Maybe it's bitterness. And you're going around and you're around and you're around. And you're refusing to land. But we know that at some point, that plane runs out of gas. So what can we do in 2021 so that we don't crash our faith? I've got three quick thoughts for you in the book of 1 Samuel that I think can help. 
And if you can take these three thoughts, you can call it whatever you want. Call it your New Year's resolution. Call it recommendations for further consideration. If you think a New Year's resolution is too intense at this point, I get it. I understand. Most Americans fail at it. But I want you to listen to these three quick thoughts. Number one, here on the slide, pursue godly people. Number two, love your enemy. And number three, speak up. Number one, pursue godly people. Number two, love your enemy. Number three, speak up. If you have your Bibles, whip it out. If you have your phones, whip them out. We're going to turn over to 1 Samuel 24, and we're going to read the Word of God this morning. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men, from all Israel, and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Some of you are like, what is going on here? And let me give you a little context before we dive deep into that text. But Saul at this time is the king of Israel. And he's on this and campaign, like he's like a renegade to kill David. And many of us know David as that shepherd boy, right? The one that slayed Goliath. That was David. Also, he was known as the greatest king of Israel. And in order to stay on the throne, Saul was trying to destroy him. Because a prophet named Samuel, which is the book was written after him, right? The prophet Samuel, he spoke directly to God. And Samuel was in charge of managing the spiritual affairs of the nation. He was... He was the old school evangelist or minister or pastor. And his job was to stay in good connection with God and to help the people of Israel follow him. But he also would guide the kings and he would anoint them because God would tell him, this is the king I want to lead the nation of Israel. So Samuel had anointed David while Saul was still king. So David was supposed to be the king and Saul didn't like that. But the reason that Samuel did this is because Saul failed to follow God in some major decisions. And he started following his own ideas and what he thought was he thought was right. So even though David should have been on the throne, we see him here fleeing for his life, bouncing from cave to cave and village and village. And Saul is here trying to pursue him. That's why it says when he was told David is in the desert of, of En Gedi, he leaves to go there because he knows that if he could just take David out, he can hold on to the power. He can hold on to the throne. And David, this is important here, David is going through probably the hardest time of his life. Now remember, shepherd boy to becoming king, there's this in-between stage. <laughs> In between stage, that was extremely difficult. So he's going through it as Saul pursues him unjustly. You could think of this time as David's 2020. And to make matters even more complicated, he was faithful to God. As we see in this verse. Because Saul was relieving himself. And we know what that means, right? It's, but like, it's, the actual translation, relieve himself, is cover his feet, if you read in the Hebrew. So when we think of relieving ourselves, we mean maybe someone going to the side of the road, unzipping their pants and peeing, right? But no, 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 no. Saul put down his garments and he was crouching. He covered his feet with what? His garments. And he was likely crouching in the corner of a cave. So he was in a very vulnerable position. And David's men and David were in that same cave. How did that happen? I don't know, but they were there. And they could, they noticed Saul, maybe because of the smell or something. I don't know. They noticed that. 
And his men start hyping him up saying, look, you can take him out right now. And they even brought God into the equation. And they said, the Lord said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand. Essentially telling David what he wanted to hear. He was having a rough year. And the man that was trying to take his life, he now had in the palm of his hands. But we learn and we see that that's not what David chose, right? He crept up and he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He could have destroyed, he could have killed him. But he decided not to. And my point here, a quick point, is that we have to pursue godly people. And uh, just so you know, these men that were advising David in 1 Samuel, verse 22, this is what they say about these men. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontent gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. So these men were distressed. They were in debt and they were discontent. They were from the nation of Israel and they were just sick of it. And they're telling David, take out the guy that's leading this thing. You see? Take out the guy that's trying to kill you. It's what David wanted to hear. It's what they wanted to hear. But David knew that's not what God wanted. And my simple point here is that oftentimes we can surround ourselves with people who just tell us what we want to hear. And they'll even bring God into it. They'll say, didn't God say this to you one time? Didn't you have that arbitrary prayer where you kind of felt something sort of so that now you can do whatever you want? But in reality, their hearts aren't to help you get closer to God. But in order to move forward, we must put people in our lives that will help us know God. Do what he says, especially when it's uncomfortable. And push against the easy decision to choose the righteous decision. We've got to pursue godly people. And I know it gets annoying. I know it gets frustrating. You, you text them. They're busy all the time. You're like, oh, no, they didn't respond to my text. Text them again. you got to persevere. If you, if you want to learn something that you need to hear, you got to persevere. If it's something that you need to hear, you've got to persevere. And oftentimes, it doesn't come with our echo chambers of people that we surround ourselves with. It comes with that person or maybe that group of people that you're like, oh, if I talk to them, I know they're going to say something. David didn't have that. And he still choose, chose to do what's right. But oftentimes... That doesn't work. We need to pursue godly people. Let's keep reading. 1 Samuel 24, 24, verse 5 says this. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I, that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. Wow. Incredible heart. You know what I saw in 2020? I saw lots of Christians <laughs> in the L.A. church and in the greater church as well. Treat other brothers and sisters in Christ as enemies. Was I the only one that saw that? <laughs> Did you see it too? You know what else I saw? I saw social media become, it's been, it's been becoming, but it, it was even more apparent this past year, become the means by which Christians base their doctrine on more than the word of God. And all that messaging implicitly or explicitly said, hate your enemy. Do you. 
Don't let anyone bring you down. Hate the other side and polarize people so far. So let's think through this for a sec. You've got a combination of people surrounding themselves with those that aren't really bringing them closer to God, which may or may not be you. I'm not calling you. I'm just saying it's possible. I know I've had that in my life before. Coupled with messaging that's constantly telling us to hate the other side, to hate our enemies. That leads to the perfect storm, right? It leads to the gospel being destroyed. 2020 was not just a health pandemic. It was a heart pandemic. And I love what our beloved brother, Dr. Charles Bray, once said during one of our Kingdom Inclusion team meetings. He said this, You think COVID is bad? Hatred is worse. You know why? It consumes you. It destroys us in ways that no physical ailment can. And David was at this moment here where he was conscience-stricken. He felt guilty for cutting off a piece of Saul's robe. His heart was soft. And he even said to his men, The Lord forbid me. He forbid me that I should do such a thing. And he references Saul as his master, the Lord's anointed. He was totally justified if he wanted to kill Saul. Because Saul was trying to kill him. He has a pretty good legal case of self-defense if you were to ask me. But no, David saw an armed resistance against the king of Israel as an act of rebellion towards God. He saw the events of his life as tough as they were from the Lord's perspective rather than from that of the world. How do we love our enemies? We can't just talk the talk. We've got to seriously learn what it means to love God. That is the only way we can do this. David loved his enemy. Whether you're a Christian or not, I want to call you, love those who don't think like you, who don't agree with you, who don't believe everything that you believe. It's not easy and it's not comfortable, but it will help you move forward in your faith. And you'll love people in a way that you've never been able to experience before. Okay, last Thought. Speak up. Let's keep reading. 1 Samuel 24, verse 8. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day... You have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay a hand, lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil. So my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea? 
May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Beautiful. Wow. David does something incredible here. He calls out Saul, the guy trying to kill him, the guy in power. But he does it in a way that shows respect, calling him the Lord's anointed. He does it in a way that shows humility. When he says, may he consider, may God consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from the hands, from your hand. He trusts in God, but he speaks up. He spoke up. He said something. He wasn't silent and just hoping for things just to work out perfectly. He said something. And here's a phrase I feel like is believing, is uh, killing American Christianity, particularly with millennials and Gen Zers. And it's a phrase that I hear often. It's a phrase I've heard for years. And it's a phrase that irks me now because it, on the surface, it actually does make sense, but I don't think it's really communicated in a healthy way. So what is said is this. I don't want to impose my beliefs on someone else. That is what it said. That is the phrase that I feel like is killing American Christianity, particularly the youth. I don't want to impose my beliefs on someone else. But here's what I think is meant often. Now, obviously, I do not agree with us pushing ourselves to a point where people feel so pressure, so pressured, that they're going to start believing in what we believe simply because of that pressure that we're applying on them. I don't think we should be putting a gun to anyone's head and saying, believe in Christ. That is wrong. But in American culture, where ideas are free-flowing, here's what I think is meant by this phrase more often than not. And I've heard so many Christians say this, but here's what I think is meant. I will not speak up about God if it could risk offending anyone. I will not speak up about God if it could risk offending anyone. So you hear this seemingly right statement, don't impose my beliefs. And yes, I agree. But what it leads to is so many young people who are silent about God, who aren't saying anything about Him. They're not even sharing that they believe in Him. Our culture is taking out our youth. Millennials, Gen Zers, let me be very clear. You need to speak up about your faith. You've got to be confident about who God is. Because what I hear when I hear that statement now is, I'm not going to say anything because I fear that someone might feel bad. Someone might disagree. Someone might feel hurt. So we're silent. And the only times that we talk about real things with people are in the small groups of other Christians who already know the truth. We're called to go proclaim the gospel. And we can't do that if we're afraid to speak up to people that don't know God, the people that disagree with us, the people that don't even know what to believe. We have to be faithful. We need to take a lesson from David, who had all the right reasons not to say anything, all the right fear, insecurity, he was fleeing for his life and he still chose to speak up, but he did it in a way that was humble and honest and truthful. He said, you're hurting me, Saul. 
but you are the Lord's anointed, and I will not lay a hand on you. If we could have that kind of courage, man, maybe it wouldn't be so discouraging when we go out and share about the gospel. Maybe it could be uplifting. So I want to close with just a quick story, personal story. And and when I was a sophomore or freshman at UCLA, I remember high school was rough for me. And I spent a lot of time just fearful about my faith, insecure about whether or not I could speak up and share about it. Really bad at loving my enemies. I was very spiteful. Um, And I definitely did not surround myself with people that were godly helping me. But I remember this one incident which really changed my paradigm. And I had spent sixth grade through uh, senior year in high school building a good friend group. And all of our friends were at different colleges at this point when I was at UCLA. But I remember there was this one, one friend of mine named Julian. And Julian was such a great, down-to-earth, awesome, awesome friend. And I spent pretty much two to three times a week hanging out with him from sixth grade to my senior year in high school. And I remember in eighth grade, I became a Christian. And that was life-changing and helpful. But I was so afraid to share with my friends about God, especially the ones I had, I had met before I became a Christian, because they saw me do some things that I was so just, just ashamed about. So I felt like, how could they ever believe me, or how could they ever listen to me? So what I did was I just was silent. <laughs> I was silent, like for years. And I remember my freshman year at UCLA, thinking, I get a new start, new beginning. I don't have to deal with all the people and the baggage, new people. And I was so excited uh, to set a start and planting my identity with God. But I remember getting a call from one of my friends. And he said, did you hear what happened to Julian? I was like, no. What what happened? And he told me that Julian, uh, I think he was at a university in Miami at the time, but Julian had um, walked up on top of his dorm, the roof of his dorm, jumped off, and he committed suicide. And I remember my freshman year, just having all the rush of emotions hit me and just thinking, oh my gosh, I spent, I don't know, Monday through Friday at school and sometimes on the weekend hanging out with this guy from sixth grade to my senior year in high school. And I was so afraid of imposing my beliefs on Julian that I didn't tell him anything about my walk with God. I didn't share anything about the truth that which I believed in. I remember that day I made a decision that I would never be fearful again. Regardless of how tough or difficult life became, I would never be fearful again. And lately in my walk with God, I've been fearful. 2020 was a scary year. But I take some solace with this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which we'll close here. He says, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. In such a church, the world finds a cheap covering for its sin. No contrition is required, still less any real desire to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without without Jesus Christ. Amazing. Amazing, amazing admonition here from a man who gave his life to God. And I want to implore you, and I want to call you out, I want to encourage you, let's start off 2021 by not cheapening the grace that God has given us. If you've decided to be a Christian and placed your life in Him, it cost Jesus everything. And we know that when something's cheap, 
We don't take care of it that much. We could just buy another one later, right? But when something is costly, when we see its value, we protect it. We nurture it. We focus on it. We take care of it. We want others to see it. John 14, verse 6. It says, I am the way. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Brothers and sisters, those visiting with us for the first time, I call us to move forward. And it's 2021, and 2020 was a rough time, and I know we can get stuck in the past, but I call you to move forward. Students, we had the pandemic, and maybe you had a couple weeks off of school, but you're still going to school. Adults, you had a couple weeks off of work, it was kind of weird, it was nice, but you still got to work. We need to find a way to still be faithful, to still pursue Christ, no matter the circumstances, because we're called to move forward in our faith and in our trust in God and in our mission as ambassadors of Christ. Do we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? If we can focus on that, this will change our 2021. And lastly, Normally, I have action steps. I'm sorry, I decided to embed them within the overall structure. Pursue godly people. Love your enemies. Speak up. However, I did want to leave you with a song, and I'm going to put it in the chat. And I want you to take some time to meditate on the lyrics throughout the week and start making some decisions. And I want you to commit to helping one person this year understand the costly grace that, of God giving his son for humankind. Just one person. This year, commit to helping one person. Whether it's in, in a Bible study or maybe you grab some other Christians with you and you both are in Bible studies where you're trying to help someone who, who has admitted that they don't know him that way. They don't know him like that. They don't understand how costly that grace was. And share, share what you know with them. I guarantee you, if you feel stuck, you feel discouraged, you feel like 2020 is still dragging you down, this will help you move forward in your relationship with God. Thank you guys for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and like this message. Have an amazing Sunday, and welcome to 2021. I'm honored to share with you a scripture and some thoughts for our offering today. About offerings. Old Testament scriptures teach us that a sacrificial system of animal blood and grain offerings were utilized as gifts to God for atonement of sins and for worship. New Testament scriptures reminds us that the sacrificial system of animal blood and grain offerings were permanently ended once and for all as the work of redemption was completed through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What offerings then remain today that are pleasing to God? The answer can be found in Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. And it reads, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Before I studied the Bible, 
I believe that Jesus was the Savior of the world. I should avoid major sins, and whatever I put in the offering tray was sufficient to please God. Shortly after the New Year's in January of 1995, I chose to stay at work, and therefore I missed my very first First Principles Bible Study midweek class. My daughter, Samantha, a newly baptized disciple then, boldly advised me that I was more devoted to my work than God. I'm so thankful that I listened to her, as I was truly cut to the heart by every single First Principles class thereafter. And at the end, I was baptized, January 26, 1995. Now, after nearly 26 years, I can truly profess with certainty that any financial sacrifices and offerings that are pleasing to God establishes and strengthens faith in Him, encourages obedience to His Word, promotes devotion that honors Him, and provides service to and for others. Brothers and sisters, let us pray together for the offering. Merciful and almighty God, we thank you for the gifts and the promise of your gift to come. We thank you for Jesus, Father, who sacrificed everything in obedience to you. We cannot outgive the giver that is you, Father. Help us to receive and appreciate what we receive. Help us to give those gifts, Father, that will be devoted to you, that will honor you, that will advance your kingdom, that will support others, Father, and provide goods and services and the needs of those who need from us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to examine your word, to expand our thoughts and our hearts. We thank you for the opportunity, Father, to just be obedient to your word. And it's in your Son, Christ Jesus' name, that we offer this gift for offering. We thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you. Well, that's it for our time this morning. I really just want to thank our speakers, Kenny, Patricia, Serena, for sharing your hearts and really ministering to us this morning. I know that God has a great plan for 2021, and you guys started off on such a great note. Now, here are just a few reminders for this week. The first being that on Wednesday, we will be meeting in small groups for midweek. Uh, the other is that we will actually, on January 13th, will be getting a series on church history. Uh, we have a couple of guest speakers to uh, come share lessons with y'all, which I personally am very excited to hear these. If I've grown up in the church, something I've always been interested in, but never really gone deep into. And I know it's something that many others are excited to hear as well. And it's going to be fantastic. I encourage all of you to be there. We also will be back on this channel on Sunday at 1030 Pacific Standard Time, as always. And I just really want to thank everyone for spending your Sunday with us. If you would like to connect with us, please go to our website, uh, thewestsidechurch.com. And also, I really encourage everyone here to share this video, this uh, sermon, the communion, everything with uh, someone. There's, it could be a family member, a friend, co-worker, someone you met at a Starbucks, someone you haven't talked to in a couple of years, because the Bible is clear that God's word will not return empty. And we never know how he's working. It could be a blind step of faith because that's all God really needs to change a lifetime and an eternity, ultimately. Now, guys, everyone, make sure to like that this video, smash that subscribe button, ring that bell, uh, so you can just be notified and see you supporting us so that we can eventually grow and minister to more people as well. Now, I'd like to end our time and our service this morning with a prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are a sovereign God. 
You are an incredible God. You are someone who constantly amazes me. And I pray as we go into this new year, we do not go in with fear, with anticip this anticipation of something bad is going to happen. Uh, I pray that we just look and we leave the past in the past, that we learn from the mistakes, that we learn that ultimately you can work through all things, God. And I don't know what this year has for us, but whatever it is, I know that as you are standing by our sides, we can overcome it all with the victories and the defeats, your son and the message that he sent on the cross. It changed the world. And you had this year in mind when you created the universe and you have been so excited of what blessings, what miracles you were going to accomplish this year. And I pray that we are obedient, that we are willing to listen to what your call is, God. I love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Clothed in red. 
of living color Flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder We'll be right back. 